I wanted to put uh, our conversation today both in historical perspective but then speak about some principles for us as Muslims to engage in the current period. Uh, in 1964, uh, an important event in the long history of the civil rights movement took place. Uh, this event it takes place on November 14, 1964, and it involves the desegregation of uh, schools in the South and the story of Ruby Bridges. Uh, Ruby Bridges was born in September 8, 1954, and was the first black child to attend an all-white school in Louisiana on November 14, 1964. She attended William Franz Elementary School. In lead up to the first day of classes, actually, there were six kids that were approved for admittance into an all-white school. Two stayed at their own old school, Three transferred to another school. Only Ruby Bridges decided to go to an all-white school. Her father was reluctant to actually allow her because of the severity of the racism, the discrimination, the open hostility that was directed at African Americans at the time. Her mother actually was the one that encouraged her father and herself she, saying, quote, take this step forward for all African-American children. So finally, she attended the school. That's not the story. The story that all white parents pulled their children from the school. Okay, so again, the response from the dominant society. All teachers refused to teach Ruby in the school. So you have parents pulling their children out. You have teachers refusing to teach. Only one teacher, Barbara Henry from Massachusetts, decided to teach Ruby. And for almost a whole year, she was teaching Ruby in the school in a classroom by herself, as if she teaching a whole class. More importantly, every morning when Ruby was walking to school, one woman would threaten to poison her. That's why U.S. Marshals that were dispatched by President Eisenhower ordered her not to eat anything except the food that she brings with her from home. It has to be tested and verified that it is not a food that has been poisoned. Another, another woman that stood at the school would put a black doll in a coffin in the classroom and also hold a black doll in a coffin outside to scare Ruby Bridges that essentially she's going to be dead or will be killed. Ruby had actually was more scared of that doll in the coffin than anything or anything been said to her or the nasty statement or the protest that was taking place. At her mother's suggestion, Ruby actually started to pray. And her mother actually asked her to pray to keep her mind away from what is being done to her and all the circumstances that she's facing. And that provided Ruby with comfort in facing the racism that she has been subjugated to. Now, one of the most famous American painters painted a painting that memorized the incidents and the circumstances that Ruby have faced, Norman Rockwell, the problem that we all live with. 
which is the problem of racism. Also later on, her story was made into a movie as well as a children's book. Now I'm saying this because we're right now living a history that is undoing much of the gains that have been registered during the civil rights movement. It is also, we're looking at the history of 1967-68, where Martin Luther King gave two important speeches that we as Muslims, as well as those who are working in civil rights, need to revisit. One speech, silence is betrayal, and the second speech, the three evils of society. So 1967, Martin Luther King broke away from the president and began to take opposition to the Vietnam War. And then followed it by another speech in 68, just months before his assassination, where he focused on the three evils of society. The three evils of society are militarism, materialism, and racism. These are the same three evils that we are living with today. If anything, they have accelerated and intensified. Where we have a military budget in this country, 660 billion, and then a possibility of another $54 billion added to it. At a time where we're closing schools, we're trying to cut meals on wheels, we're trying to eliminate health care, militarism is still with us. It is embedded in our economy or the military industrial economy. Materialism is also with us. Oxfam has had issued a report early this year which says 62 individuals, 62 individuals have more wealth than 3.5 billion people in the world. Let me repeat this. 62 individuals have more wealth than 3.5 billion people. That type of concentration of wealth is a pernicious hold on human capacity to have a future horizon. And I think if we think about the needs of the society today, the United Nations said that to eliminate hunger in the world, we, we need to invest between 20 to 50 billion. 20 to 50 billion. Combining materialism and militarism, the world spent $1.4 trillion on militarism, yet is unable to invest 20 to 50 billion to address poverty and eliminate poverty as well as other diseases. Much of this militarism and materialism that are connected comes to us in here in the United States or in Europe. It is not surprising that our own country, our own country, has a hold of 55% of the global market on arms sale. So whenever somebody poses the question to me about Muslim violence, I respond saying, stop selling us guns that actually gets people to kill each other. Because you cannot, on the one hand, preach peace, while at the same time selling and sending armed merchants to sell weapons across the world. There is a contradiction in this. Now, what is important in Martin Luther King's speeches is the following, and this is something for us to understand. In 67 and 68, 67 and 68, the overwhelming majority of the American public was against Martin Luther King. The polling data at the time was over 70% of the American public opposed Martin Luther King. They saw his positions to be outside of the mainstream. Today, history remembers that Martin Luther King was on the right side of history 
and those who opposed him are in the dustbin of history. We need to understand this. Now, for us as Muslims, and moving to the second part of my talk, which is how for us to engage at a time where our civil rights have been eroded, our human rights have been eroded. The three gains of the civil rights movement was the Civil Rights Act, the Immigration Rights Act, and the Voter Rights Act. Those were the fundamental gains of the civil rights movement. All those three are under assault today in this country. And therefore, as Muslims, what is our role to play in defending constitutional rights, in defending civil rights, and shaping a better future for us and for those that come after us, both domestically, locally, as well as our contribution across the world? What I want to offer to you is a set of principles because what we need to contribute is to say, here are our principles by which we engage on the issues, because we're going to be confronted with a variety of different challenges, and we always have to resort to a set of principles to operate. So I'm going to enumerate these principles that's going to be part of a book that I'm working on. And if you don't write them or you don't remember them, we'll get to visit them in the future. First, Muslims have to have a commitment to justice. That is at the foundation of our tradition. A commitment to universal and indivisible justice. We cannot act with just us. That is not what the Quran is actually always demanding of us. The Quran demands for us to actually uphold universal justice, even against our own self. So we have to set aside our narrow self-interest and think that the only way for us to engage is with a just us approach to political and civic engagement in this country. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a number of verses in the Quran demands of us to uphold justice. Allah himself is al-adl. Allah himself is al-adl. Allah prohibited injustice on, him, on his own self. So that is a principle that we operate by. The second principle, that we have to understand all human beings are endowed with dignity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, That we have ennobled the human being. We might differ with people on certain issues, but that should not make us strip them of their human dignity. That is foundational. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ That all human beings are dignified. And that has to be at the foundation of our engagement in civic engagement. So sometimes we have to actually be patient to work with those who oppose us in order for us to transform them from enemies to actually be partners in changing and altering the society. If you don't understand this, just think of the Prophet ﷺ in relations to Mecca and how treated Quraysh. Again, I'm not asking you to be an Uncle Tom in actually manifesting the dignity of the human being, but to understand in terms of how your worldview will determine your political and civic engagement. Third, equality. Equality of all human beings, equality among men and women, equality is at the foundation of our tradition. كُلُّكُمْ مِنْ آدَمْ وَآدَمْ مِنْ تُرَابْ All of you are, comes from Adam, and Adam is from the dust of the earth, so there is no boasting whatsoever. And the measure in the Quran is the taqwa. Right? God consciousness is the measure of taqwa that is at the foundation of our tradition which means that we have to deal with our internalized racism. We have to do away with our hierarchical understanding of ourselves and the society. And I know people boast about where they come from and so on, and we need to begin to deal with this. The basis of our Islamic understanding is equality of everyone. All human beings are equal on the same footing. Fourth, fourth, 
all life is sacred. And this is, comes to us from usul, from the five overarching principles of Islamic law. Life is sacred. All life is sacred. And we need to understand how to uphold the sacredness of life. All right? So again, this is a principle that we have to apply and continue to engage, which means that sometimes we have to take position as, for example, the death penalty that is taking place right now, where they are actually put seven individuals to death in 11 days in, uh, in the state of Kentucky. How is that reconciled in relations to the hierarchy of race where most of those on death penalty are African Americans because there is a racialized justice system. So we need to understand because often people immediately resort to their Islamic understanding that death penalty is permissible in Islam, but they don't understand how the articulation of that is actually within Islamic law and how to look at the priorities relative to the first principle of justice and reconcile it with all life is sacred. So there has to be some digging of our own understanding in this country and not to confuse the set of priorities that we apply in, in, in our civic and engagement in this society. Five, or the fifth principle, freedom is the basis foundation of every human being. Freedom, hurriya. All right? Umar ibn Khattab was in reproaching one. He says, how do you take people to be slaves and their own mother have given birth to them in a state of freedom? That is at the foundation. And anything that negates, anything that restricts, anything that in contravene the state of freedom has to be opposed. So we need to understand how to relate to this as a foundation. Six, and this is a, a long discourse, but the concept of khilafah, right, in the Muslim world have, inge have resulted in khilaf rather than custodianship. So khilafah has to be understood as custodianship rather than thinking that you're the mighty one on earth. So custodianship has a, a specific type of responsibility over everything in the world as a way to leave it better to the next generation. Because we're Khalifatullah fil ard, we're not the mighty Pharaoh on earth. That's a different conceptualization. And sometimes Muslims have adopted colonial, post colonial understanding of the Khilafah and apply it in, a, in the same way in a colonial, post colonial, as they got into a state of weakness, they adopted that which made them weak, and they think that is an articulation of the Islamic ethics of what Khilafah is all about. So we need to rethink some of our own thoughts in order for us to apply it in that way. So Khilafah, and I have a long discourse on that, but the principle of custodianship. Seven, economic equity. Economic equity. And how to deal with economic fairness, equality, Trade based on contentment, not capitalism or materialism. And I know Muslims have adopted what I call success theology, that God wants you to be rich. Yes, God wants you to be rich, but that's not the foundation of Islamic economics or not the foundation of our own understanding of how to engage in a trade based on contentment, that both parties are content with the transaction. Neoliberal economic model is not the basis of economic of the Islamic ethics of economic engagement in the world. So we have to both critique ourselves as well as critique the society and engage of how to bring a different economic model because that is the challenge of how to bring a different economic model to the world. The disparity between the haves and have and have not is expanding. What we have today is the have and have some more and the have nothing at all is the basis of the economic model that is there. And we cannot, as Muslims, say that, well, Islam is for capitalism and just join in the crowd and think that we're manifesting the high ideals or the principles of Islamic economic understanding. So there has to be some principles that we operate by. Eighth, oppression is not divine. Oppression is not divine. Wherever you see oppression at the local level or the national level or international level, you have the obligation to speak against it. 
you have the obligation. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala harrama ala nafsihi al-dhulm. Allah himself forbade oppression on himself. And therefore, he commanded us not to oppress one another. Therefore, wherever oppression takes place and you speak, you're speaking from a divine foundation. You are speaking from a divine foundation. And that's something that as Muslims we have to speak, especially as we see the Muslims across the world are actually at the receiving end of oppression. So silence becomes a form of consent in relation to our position in here. Ninth, and I know that time is running out for me, action. Iman has to be commensurate and added to action, al-iman wal-amal. Wherever iman in the Quran is mentioned, there is action. And I know some Muslims, yeah, I believe, akhi, but I, really I don't want to do the work because it's a, there has to be a manifestation of iman. The inward has to be manifested outward, which means that we have to take actions locally, nationally, and internationally. So for Muslims, you need to be out and engage in the civil society in general. So I want to see Muslims out active, to be engaged, to be at every element of the society. Not only that we show up every four years or every two years to vote, I want people to run for elections. I want people to actually challenge every part of the society. I want you to go to the library board, of board and run for it. I want you to volunteer for your school, your school newspaper. I want you to be in every part of the society. Why? Because you're representing the highest ideal of Islam. Sitting at home by yourself will not change the society. You have to be there and be the agent of change on a daily basis. That's what civic engagement means and that's what changing the paradigm. The last one is that we have to be merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, غَلَبَتْ رَحْمَتِي غَضَبِي That the overarching umbrella by which we operate as Muslims is mercy. Our prophet is known as وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except to a mercy to mankind. So Allah defined himself in terms of his action to be merciful over ghadab. And the prophet is a prophet of mercy, meaning that we have to manifest an eye of mercy in looking at our engagement in the society, which requires some level of comprehension of what does mercy means and when to deploy it. So that's a fundamental. And last two, is that you have to have ikhlas and you have to have amana. Our civic engagement is based on ikhlas, sincerity, and amana, that you are actually trustworthy. And that is the definition when they ask about the Prophet in Mecca, he was known as the trustworthy, al-ameen. We are the people of amana. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam was the person of amana. We are not ones to jump and be like people. We are the people that when they want somebody to testify, they say, bring the Muslim to testify. Shuhada ala nas that you are to bear witness on people, and that cannot, be, cannot occur except if you are amin. You have to be people of amana, because this time, this world, this moment, need the trustworthy people, the merciful people, the just people to come forward. Are you those people, or are you the ones that are sleeping on the wheel? Let's be those people. Time for us to stand up and change the history of this country and the world. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.